Well, hello everyone and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and we welcome all of you for joining us today. Yeah, no doubt. Renee, it's great to be with you today. Another beautiful day here in Kentucky. And um, a big thanks to all of you all joining us, whether you're on Zoom or Facebook Live, we're glad to have you. Um, as a reminder, we do record these sessions and they will be available afterwards um, on fromthewoodstoday.com. Before we get started, um, I guess today's show's lineup. Billy, what do we have in store for today? Well, we've got Dr. Matt Springer. He's going to be doing his first part of a, a multi-part food plot series. You know, food plots are a thing that a lot of landowners are interested in installing on their property, and um, they're trying to benefit wildlife. So when we got Matt on, he's going to be talking about kind of that first part of planning for your food plot. And then we have Martha Yawn on. She's going to be talking about kind of wildlife, but in a way that we eat it. Um, she's going to be doing some venison chili. There's a Cook Wild um, program here in Kentucky, and Martha's going to tell us a little bit about that. Um, and then we're going to wrap it up with the tree of the week, another um, tree that is really favorable to wildlife as well. And I'll just save that one until we get to it a little bit later. But another great segment, three great presenters, and we're just really glad to have you all with us today. Uh, Matt, if you want to pull up your um, video and tell us a little bit about what we're going to see and maybe introduce your series to the audience a little bit. Yeah, good morning. Uh, so what the hope of this, this food plot series is that we're going to be able to cover from how do you pick where you may want to put a food plot through what do you do next to, you know, soil sampling, spraying the vegetation, killing the vegetation. How do you prepare that seed bed, pick your seeds and, and, and maintain the plot. So we're going to break that down with a few videos. The goal is that we can kind of cover through the entire process through a multi-week series. All right. All right. Well, it sounds good. Looking forward to it. So Renee, I guess without any further ado, we'll go ahead and get started with a Matt's presentation. Today we're going to talk a little bit about food plot site selection, soil testing, and spraying. Three really important things on the front end that have big outcomes on the, on the establishment and the success of the plot later on. So when you start off talking about where you want to put the food plot, you want to make sure you have three big things covered. First and foremost, do you have access to that spot? That really plays a big role in can you get equipment in like tractors or ATVs to help you get that food plot in place. You're gonna to have to establish the area, dig up the dirt, rough it up, get in, spray it, get your seed in the ground, and then finally maintain it. All of those which require some level of equipment. Sometimes it's something you can pack in, other times it's not. So you wanna make sure you have good access points to that area. Secondly, the reason you're putting that food plot in, you wanna make sure you're thinking about how you're gonna to get to that plot without really disturbing wildlife. If you're using it for hunting or wildlife photography, you want to make sure that that plot finds that balance between close to where the animals are routinely, while not being able too close that when you go into it, you're disturbing them and causing them to leave. So you want to make sure you have multiple access points by walking into the plot so that you minimize your disturbance while you're getting there. Now, if you're planting this food plot just to feed wildlife and you don't care about seeing them in the plot, then that's not as big of a concern. Lastly, we want to look at the surrounding area for that location to identify a couple things. First, is it a location that get dis gets disturbed a lot by either yourself, your property owners, your neighbors, or potentially people you don't even want on the property? Because the more disturbance that occurs, the less likely the wildlife are to use it as frequently. Secondly, you want to look and see what else is around it. Uh, are you competing as a food source with something nearby? So if your neighbor has an agricultural field, and they're planting corn and soybeans on a rotation, that's a really good wildlife food. So if you are thinking about planting soybeans 50 yards away from that, you're gonna have a lot of competition, especially because you're not gonna be able to produce food at the scale that that farmer is. So think about where you wanna put your food plot relative to other food sources that are potentially outside of your control. So all of those things really play a big role as you think about where you wanna put your food plot. So think, you know, access for both equipment and sneaking into your plot for your recreational use, and also disturbance levels and competition levels. That'll all help you have a good grasp of where you may want to put your food plot or may, where you may not want to put your food plot on your property.
The next section we're going to talk about soil sampling. It's a vital step in your preparation for putting a food plot in that you take soil samples. It requires three simple tools, first being the probe that our demonstrator is about to put in the soil here, second being a bucket to take that sample and put it in, and thirdly a paper bag. Now the process is relatively simple. You just put that probe into the soil about four inches. When you remove the probe, you take the soil out, put it in the bucket, and repeat the process multiple times over the entire area of the food plot. And what you're doing is you're getting a, a general idea of what the quality of that soil is in that, in that area that you picked out for your food plot. And based on that, that sample, you take that and get it processed and analyzed, and it comes back and tells you if their soil is lacking things like phosphorus or nitrogen. And then you can take steps to correct that so that you have a good solid soil base to work off right when you put your seed into that soil. It is recommended to take one sample per 20 acres. However, when you're doing food plots, you want to make sure that you're taking one sample per food plot. Now, when you finish, you take all the sample that you've collected, put it in the bucket, shake it up, and place it in the paper bag. You can take that bag to a county extension office, and they can actually get that sample processed for you, sometimes at no to little cost. Remember, this is a vital step in having a successful food plot, so don't skip taking soil samples. The next and final component we're going to cover today is talking about spraying your plot area prior to planting. And what this really is, is you're pre-treating the area so that you can kill back the existing vegetation to get a better establishment of your food plot. You're trying to eliminate any potential competition of vegetation for those seeds as they come up. Now there's various ways you could do this. Um, the way that I am doing this as an example here of the backpack full of water is walking this field um, with a backpack sprayer and just sweeping back and forth to get a good coverage. Now this is not perfect but it will be effective for a plot that is this size which for our demonstration purposes here we're using about a tenth of an acre. Now a backpack sprayer can be an efficient method to do this treatment especially in areas where you cannot get a uh, full-sized uh, tractor in with a boon on it or even in some places where ATVs may have a difficult time getting to uh, to get their sprayers in. So you can still be effective with a simple tool like a backpack sprayer. Now you want to do a little research into what vegetation is in your field that you're about to plant to know what kind of herbicide you need to use to treat the area. Now in cases where there's a lot of grasses, glyphosate is a very simple and readily available herbicide that can be applied and have a very good effective burn down of that vegetation. Now you want to do this, any kind of burn down in preparation two to three weeks before you think you may be getting in there to work that bed and create that seed bed with a um, disc or harrow. And the reason for that is you need to give the, the herbicide time to, to take effect and actually kill that vegetation. If you do use herbicides to kill the vegetation, make sure you read up and follow all safety precautions uh, when you're applying the herbicide. You want to make sure that you're using at the very least eye protection and a facial covering to pre prevent that from being inhaled. Best case scenario is you're wearing protective clothing to cover up your entire body. Now, because I'm doing this by hand, I'm actually leaving the possibility of missing some areas, and I guarantee you I have. So what we can do is we can actually go back about a week and a half after this and make sure we spot check those areas to get, a, to get those potential green areas that we missed. As you can see, I'm very slowly walking and, and taking that sprayer uh, across my body just to get as good of a coverage as possible. Now, this is not perfect, but it should do the job for this tenth of an acre plot that we're using as demonstration. So in the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk a little bit more about the equipment you're going to need to get these food plots established, including how we're going to apply those soil tests that we ta had taken, what kind of seed selection you can go through, and, and how do you then plant that seed that you select. Finally, we're going to talk a little bit more about maintaining these plots and how to determine if you've had a success. As usual, you can always reach out to your county extension office with any questions, or find us here at the Forestry and Natural Resources Extension team, and we'd be happy to help you out. Thanks again for that presentation on food plots. We greatly appreciate it. And I want to remind everyone, if you do have a question, make sure to type them in the chat pod. Matt, okay, so now I've worked with you for a long time now, and you've kind of down food plots a little bit in other conversations we've had. So tell me a little bit of a reason why someone should want one or should or should not do it. 
Sure. The, uh, food plots are uh, a management strategy that definitely has its place. Um, unfortunately, the hunting magazines and the hunting shows have really played them up to be a very large component of wildlife management. And to be honest, when we look at, at coming up with our management plans for a property, food plots are generally only one to two percent of the actual property. We don't want them to be a large component. We'd rather have a solid you know, system, a native system present that provides all the components these animals are used to. Because when you think about it, there weren't food plots back in the 1600s, 1500s, pre-European settlement. You know, right. you had fire that was used by uh, our um, Native Americans, but they weren't out there planting fields for wildlife. So these guys are, are really, you know, the wildlife are used to the native habitat. So if, as long as you have a strong system in place, healthy woods, healthy grasslands, you know, then food plots really are unnecessary. So they should make up a very small component because they are effective at what they do, which is attract wildlife to a very particular area. So small component of the overall management strategy but still a good thing to have um, on your property if you really want to. Oh, okay. Mostly yeah, it's everyone goes overboard with them. And, and <laughs> really should be going overboard with their invasive species control and their right. wood harvest and, and making sure they have a proper age structure for their, their right. team. Right. I was gonna say, Matt, you know, you and I've had that conversation before. You know, I think a lot of times the, the attraction of the food plot is it's really kind of finite and it's manageable and it and people feel like they're really making a big benefit to wildlife. And I think you hit on, you know, kind of a more holistic look at your property, uh, maybe a better use, but it can come in handy, um, like you said, for certain needs and, and especially if you may be in an area that doesn't have enough food around for wildlife. So yeah, it, it's true. And um, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, and I guess fortunately for wildlife, most of our species aren't food limited in Kentucky. So, you know, needing to put food in place is not a huge demand to keep these guys alive. Um, you know, other places where soil quality is a lot lower, like in the south, having a rich soil with a good food source that has all those nutrients in it actually is something they could use. Here we have pretty darn good soil and, and uh, a food plot is just supplementing what's already out there. Right. Well, if we're gonna do it, we wanna do it right. You know, so I appreciate you putting this series together for folks that are interested in it and um, you know, and it gives them kind of some good guidance on how they can kind of proceed. And, and we'll look forward to the future segments of this as we kind of get going with it, man. So thank you very much. No problem, glad to do it. Yeah. And, and Renee, you know, we, if there are questions, you know, we encourage people to use our chat pod. And if you are on Facebook Live, you can leave comments and we'll respond to those as soon as we can. But if you did have any quick questions for Dr. Springer, um, you can go ahead and reach out to us right now. Or if you think about it a little bit later, uh, Matt's going to be with us, I think, for the duration of the show. So he can maybe address them a little bit later. Um, that tends to happen right. a lot. You're like, ooh, I should have asked them that one. I know. I was, you know yeah. And now I'm not thinking about it. So we can always yeah. get your questions answered no matter what time. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah, no doubt. So, all right. Well, I'm not seeing any um, immediate questions for Matt this second. So Matt, just hang tight with us. And um, we're going to go ahead and bring up Martha. Uh, Martha Yaunt is with the Cooperative Extension Service as well. And, um, you know, Martha, we're really glad to have you with us. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do with the Cooperative Extension Service. Well, now, I've been with Extension for over 30 years, but the last five or so, I've been working with the Nutrition Education Program, and that, if you go down the chain, so we're part of the University of Kentucky, we're part of College of Agriculture, we're part of Cooperative Extension, then I'm part of Family and Consumer Sciences, and then finally, the Nutrition Education Program, and we have an exciting new project that's only about a year old that I'm not the lead on, but I've really enjoyed work, working with it. It's called Cook Wild Kentucky. And uh, so I have, I don't know how, how you want to roll with this, Billy, but I've mm -hmm. got one slide for the beginning and then mm -hmm. one video, and then I've got a few more pictures after, after okay. that. Okay. Well, if you want to bring up that first slide and then I can play your video and then we can um, get back to your other pictures. A nice bonus to those food plots or any for woodland owners is that you can do some hunting. But then part of being a responsible hunter is making sure that that meat gets used and is not wasted. And so several years ago, a food pantry had had some venison donated by a group of hunters who enjoyed the hunting, but they didn't really care for eating the venison. But the food pantry found out they were having trouble distributing the meat because people weren't sure how to cook it. Mm -hmm. 
And so that was a request that came to the nutrition education program. And so this has developed into a partnership. I'm looking over here to my other screen to make sure I get everybody, but it's between Cooperative Extension, FCS, Nutrition Education, and also the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, Feeding Kentucky, which is a many of our food banks, food pantries, Hunters for the Hungry, which is an organized group of hunters that donate their excess meat to food pantries to be used um, for people who need it and the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. So it has been a really fun project. Jan Nappage, who is the Nutrition Education Program's Food Systems Specialist, spearheads this, and she has done a fabulous job of getting everything connected. And then the fun part for me is the recipes that have come from that. And so in fall of 2019, we, we published 17 recipe cards, and those were distributed to every extension office in the state. And they included recipes for venison, fish, frog legs, duck, dove, and rabbit. We, we had hoped, you know, COVID-19 has thrown a, a monkey wrench in a lot of things, but we had hoped uh, for this fall to have some additional recipes. We've been working on the, the recipe development and we were doing trials for some more venison and fish, but also elk, turkey, turtle, squirrel, raccoon, and beaver. And yes, I got, I got to do the fun part of testing <laughs> Those less common meats. And I just got the message from Jan this morning. Uh, we had to go with a reduced number, but seven are in the final stage of getting ready to print. And I'm just going to tell you the names of those real quick. Venison cabbage rolls, hot turkey salad, which is fabulous. The barbecued venison meatball is also really good. Catch of the day burger is, uh, you can use any kind of fish that you catch with that. Another great recipe. Wild turkey and broccoli casserole, slow cooker venison enchiladas, and a fireside turtle pocket. And I got to learn about uh, cooking some snapping turtle there. That was fun. Let's go ahead and, and watch the video, Billy, and then we'll come back to some more pictures. So let's go ahead and get started on our venison chili. This is one of the Cook Wild Kentucky recipes. And uh, this is some pre-cooked venison, but that's only because I thawed out a two pound package um, and I only needed one pound, so I went ahead and cooked the other pound, and I have that. I put it in the freezer, have it ready to go. We're going to add our chopped up onions and bell peppers, and I, I like to grab containers that are headed for the recycling and use those. Then if they make it back home to the recycling, great, and if they don't, then uh, it, it's not a big issue. We're going to add our canned ingredients next and it's really important that you don't forget this if you are um, cooking canned foods. So our recipe calls for tomato sauce, diced tomatoes, and two cans of chili beans. So we're going to cook this in a kettle over, um, over a fire hanging from a tripod today. There are different ways to do it. You can cook over a grate with any kind of kettle that you have. Get that little bit of uh, tomato off my fingers there. And then um, Garrett may show you I made this chili mix up ahead of time at home and that just saves me some time when we're here at camp. And so that goes in now. Here's the seasoning mix that we'll use for our venison chili. We have one tablespoon of chili powder, one half teaspoon of salt, one half teaspoon of cumin, that really gives it a nice chili flavor, one half teaspoon of garlic powder, and one fourth teaspoon of pepper. The last ingredient is one bay leaf, which does come off the bay laurel tree. We'll put that right in and we have our chili mix ready to go. So all of this is ready to head over to the fire. And you can use pot holders. This is a pair of inexpensive welding gloves. And they are great for cooking with cast iron because then I know uh, that I can handle, handle these things and not worry about burning myself. So we'll get this on our tripod. And get it stirred up. I've got 
no wait and let the smoke get away. I'm going to add the lid. And we're going to let that cook for about 30 minutes. Now I'll come back and stir and check on it. So you know if you're cooking um, in your house, you can turn a knob to turn the heat up and down. Well, if we're cooking over a fire, what we do is we just move the food farther away if we want a lower heat, or we get it closer to it if we want a higher heat. Oh, starting to boil. Too bad you can't smell this through the camera. All right, I'm going to put the lid back on and let it keep simmering. We have our venison chili. It's still nice and toasty hot in that kettle. I better share with my cameraman. And to go with that venison chili, we've got some nice warm cornbread. Well, Martha, you're making me hungry. <laughs> it was really fun to do that. And again, you know, we're, we don't have professional equipment, a lot of wind noise. Sorry about that. And, and my husband was there just with, with cell phone filming. And, and so it was, it was a fun day. But uh, no, it was a good video. It was. <laughs> and you'll notice when I was cooking, cast iron is so efficient that you don't need a lot of fire. And so that was a pretty small fire in that, uh, in, in my traveling kit when I pack and go with <laughs> little, uh, fire department. Well, you did on. say you have a couple more slides, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Some more good looking pictures too. So um, the cards are professionally printed, but you can get to them online too. But I'll just share some pictures of some of the others. This is venison stew, uh, venison sloppy joes. Those are really good. Uh, we've tasted these recipes so many times. Rabbit jambalaya, I got to learn about cooking rabbit. And this oven fried fish filet, um, you can also do this outdoors in cast iron, but it does great in your oven at home too. So where can you find the recipes? If you go to our website, which is www.planeatmove.com, and those don't, that's in the, the bottom of your screen there over on the right hand side, um, that will take you to a page that looks similar to this. And let's see, Billy or Renee, which one of you can find the tab for recipes on this screen? Can you tell tell us where it is? Because I want everybody else to be looking too. Renee? Yeah, it says plan ahead, eat well, get moving, and then recipes. Mm -hmm. Right, right there the on the top. Very good. So on the top bar. And so when you click on recipes, it takes you to a page, the recipe page. And um, you can either just scroll down and all the recipes, there's a picture for each one and just scroll down and see all of our plan eat move recipes or you can browse by category and that's that little blue bar there on the bottom left which says browse by category and then you can pick up pick out the cook wild kentucky if you just want to see the wild game and if you just want to see the venison recipes or the turtle recipes they're not there yet you can browse by ingredient so um let's see if, if that's that's probably my last one okay except for our contact information just a real quick comment about our, um, the recipes from the nutrition education program. What makes them different from other recipes that even you might find from FCS Extension or from other sources is that all of our recipes meet the dietary guidelines for Americans. And that's part of what our grant instructs us to do is to make sure that um, we limit the sodium, we limit the fat, we limit total calories and we make sure that these are some of the healthiest recipes that we find. And one out of three Kentuckians would benefit from a reduced sodium diet and I'm one of them, I have high blood pressure. And so it's good to know that all of these recipes meet those guidelines already and I don't have to try to look at the nutrition information and figure it out for myself is this one. So all of the recipes that come from the nutrition education program, cook wild recipes included, meet those dietary guidelines. So we can stop sharing that. And if there are any questions or comments, and I'm also gonna be on to the end if you think of something later. 
That's great. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. We greatly appreciate it. I know I'm even more hungry now after seeing all of that. It's almost lunchtime. <laughs> oh, Martha, I was going to comment, you know, this is just another example to me of how the Cooperative Extension Service really tries to provide solutions to issues that our folks here in the state are dealing with. And, you know, that's one of the things that makes me so proud about being part of the Cooperative Extension Service. We're really here to try to help and serve our communities in, in a variety of capacities. So thank you so much. It, it is it is one of Extension's really strong points, which is what made me interested in in that as a career. Yeah. And remember too, uh, folks, if you have any uh, questions, make sure to type them in the chat pod and uh, she can answer them for you. Um, but Martha, I was noticing, so on the, the recipe cards, does it have it where you could cook it outside or inside, or is it just one or the other? They, they're all written for inside cooking. Okay. Uh, that video that we shared was actually one that Garrett Coffee in Rockcastle County, who is doing a series of outdoor cooking on his Facebook, his uh, work Facebook page, asked me to, to partner with. And so he has some more things on outdoor cooking. And I do have several of the, our NEP approved recipes that do have some notes um, on them, how you can easily cook them outside. Of course, our published yeah. ones are all for in, inside. And they're, they're a, nice, uh, a nice printed card. So you can go to your cooperative extension office and see about getting the cards or you can find them online like I just showed you where to go. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to have to get you back on showing us some more of these great recipes. You know, we've been trying to sprinkle in food into this program. It's so important to um, us every day, you know, so, uh, but we thank you for that and, and using some of these resources that we have here in the state. Um, yes, it's, it's awesome. Thank you so much, Martha. All right, moving on. Uh, yeah, no question for Martha, but uh, we're going to keep the show rolling along. Um, we've got our uh, reoccurring segment, the Tree of the Week, and um, Laurie cannot be with us today, so I'll give it a brief introduction before I show her video. But this is a species that's really important for wildlife, and it's kind of a unique species in a lot of ways. And uh, maybe after, I'll tell you uh, an experience I had with this species that was not very favorable um, when I was in college. I was, um, yeah, so stand by and I'll let you know what that, um, that weird experience was, but Laurie mentions it in the video. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the common persimmon. Common persimmon, Diaspyros virginiana, also called simmon, possum wood, and American ebony. Persimmon is in the Ebonaceae or ebony family with most of the genera found in tropical and warmer forested regions. The common persimmon is one of the two species in the Diaspyros genus found in the United States. It is a deciduous, slow-growing tree that typically grows between 40 and 70 feet tall. The tree is probably best known for the edible fruit, which is enjoyed by humans and wildlife alike. It is an attractive landscape tree, but does not transplant easily due to the well-developed taproot. It can sometimes be confused with black gum or sourwood trees. Persimmon is native to the southeastern United States. It is found on a variety of soils and sites, but its best growth is in the bottomlands of the Mississippi River Valley. The tree commonly suckers and can form thickets, and it can be problematic in agricultural areas. Persimmon is considered shade tolerant, and it can persist in the understory of the forest for years. Persimmon is a deciduous tree with alternately arranged leaves, as you can see in the photo. The leaf form is simple. It's made up of one blade. The leaves are oval to oblong and about two and a half to five inches long. The margins of the leaf are entire, which means there are no serrations, and the leaf is shiny green above and pale or whitened below. The fall color varies from yellowish to reds with some purple and can add to its attraction as a landscape tree, in addition to its form and attractive bark. Persimmon is dioecious, with male and female flowers on different trees. The male flowers are in threes, and the female flowers are solitary and urn-shaped. They are both white to greenish white and relatively small or inconspicuous. The female flowers are fragrant. They bloom in early spring to early summer when the leaves are about half grown. The flowers are wind and insect pollinated, and persimmon flowers are useful in the production of honey. The fruit is a plum-like berry that's three-fourths to two inches in diameter. 
The fruit is green prior to ripening, turning orange to black when ripe. The ripe edible fruit is sweet with a honey-like taste and a texture that's sort of similar to apricot. The fruit ripens in mid to late fall following a hard freeze. Make sure you do not try an unripe fruit. You will not forget the very bitter, mouth-puckering, and numbing taste. Each fruit has eight flat seeds. The seeds are disseminated by birds and mammals that eat the fruit. They will remain dormant over winter with germination in April or May of the following spring. Optimal fruit production is between 25 and 50 years of age, with good seed crops about every two years. Persimmon is easily raised from seed. Just follow recommended seed preparation. And there are several cultivars of persimmon that have been selected and propagated for greater fruit size and quality. Persimmon fruit is an important wildlife food. It's eaten by squirrel, fox, skunk, deer, bear, coyote, raccoon, and possum, just to name a few, and various birds, including quail, wild turkey, cedar waxwings, and gray cat birds. The leaves and twigs are browsed by white-tailed deer. The bark is a unique characteristic of the tree. It's kind of a gray-brown with orange fissures when the trees are young, and as the trees age, the bark becomes darker and breaks up into square, scaly plates. Some describe the bark as looking like alligator bark or charcoal briquettes. Persimmon wood is heavy, hard, and strong. It has excellent shock resistance. The sapwood is white to a pale yellowish-brown and the heartwood is very dark brown to black like ebony. The wood is very close grained with an average of 14 growth rings per inch. That's a lot. Products from persimmon include golf club heads, shuttles and textile looms, turned items, and shoe last, um, which are the form shoemakers use to shape or mold shoes. The fruits are used in puddings, cookies, cakes, custards, and sherbets. And they can also be used to make a type of beer and wine. The national champion common persimmon is in Scioto, Ohio. It's 157 inches in circumference, 87 feet tall with a crown spread of 46 feet. The Kentucky champion is in Fulton County in the Obion Creek Wildlife Management Area. It is 73 inches in circumference, 104 feet tall with a 24 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Tree Register or go to the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about common persimmon. The unripe fruit and the inner bark have been used in the treatment of fever, diarrhea, and hemorrhage. An indelible ink can be made from the fruits. The common name persimmon is the Native American word for the fruit. Possums love persimmon fruit, hence another common name, possum wood. During the Civil War, soldiers boiled persimmon seeds for a coffee substitute. The scientific genus name Diaspyros means fruit or wheat of the gods. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the common persimmon and get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy the pleasing sight of the persimmon. Well, that was a great, um, a great presentation that Lori gave us. And so we're all wondering now, what's the story you're talking um, about? Okay, so she really kind of gave it away a little bit. So I was a junior in college and I was doing an internship with a forestry agency that will go unnamed. Um, but they are here in Kentucky. And um, I, I was out there with some of these foresters as a young college student trying to learn from them. And we were on a landowner's property in Scott County, and we were developing a management plan for that property. And we come across this row of trees that were persimmon. And there was some fruit on them. And, and I was really unfamiliar with persimmon at the time. And I had not seen Laurie's presentation. So I did not know that the unripe fruit were really not a very tasty thing. So they encouraged me as a young college kid to go up and try the unripe fruit of the persimmon and told me how much I would like it. So very eagerly, I went up and grabbed one and took a big old bite <laughs> and then was basically all over the ground there trying to spit it out as quick as I could. So please, as Laurie said, do not try an unripe persimmon. You will not forget it. So um, yeah. I figured that's what it was, but I wanted yeah. to just double check. <laughs> yeah. Again, it um, is, uh, yeah, yeah. Go yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, I was going to say it is a um, kind of a unique tree, and um, you know, having um, the two houses makes it kind of unique. Not a lot of our trees do have that, but uh, yeah, as you were saying, Renee, get us some questions if you have about any of the topics we've talked about today. We still have Matt and Martha on, and uh, several of us could probably try to answer some persimmon-related questions. There if are you have persimmon some. questions, yes. Uh, um, okay, so and Eric someone, and Darren, be ready. So yeah, <laughs> um, they said there's a 4-H tree walk in a park that has a problem with leaf spot, and it of common persimmon and they wanted to know is there a treatment that they can do similar to something like they do for the ash borer damage okay well fortunately it looks like um, we have dr ellen crocker on she is our forest health specialist and then ellen not to put you on the spot but um, i don't know if you heard that question or if you have any um, comments um, related to that i guess my question would be and this is a common issue with tree health uh, problems in general. Is, uh, is this a problem that's really impacting the health of the tree versus is this something that's going to look really bad? Um, you said leaf spot, like we have lots of different foliar issues. Um, some of them, let's say anthracnose, uh, aren't a problem typically for the trees long term. Uh, they may look terrible, uh, but the trees will usually recover just fine versus is this something that's going to really negatively impact the health of the tree long term. And knowing that would really impact your management decisions uh, because there's really no need to manage something that's going to resolve on its own uh, versus uh, identifying it, uh, just figuring out what you have and then determining the management uh, approach. So I'd really recommend uh, taking that route and trying to figure out what exactly is the problem. Um, there are some different ways to do that. I think a great starting place would of course be uh, taking some photographs, not just of the problem, but the whole tree itself and its context. Uh, that way we could also see, are there some abiotic issues that might be playing a role about the site mm -hmm. or other things related to that? Um, and also maybe submitting a sample if needed uh, to try to figure out what's wrong with the tree and then the course of action. Uh, there's nothing that comes to mind to me like emerald ash borer for persimmon, uh, but there certainly are issues and we've had a really tricky couple years for trees. Um, so that's something I'd recommend looking into. They say it looks bad, but it still produces fruit. Oh, well, that's a good sign. Although sometimes, like with ash, um, you mentioned emerald ash borer earlier, um, you know, they, they produce tons and tons of seeds right as they're getting ready to die. Uh, but if it, if it just kind of looks bad, but the leaves are still there and it's still able to photosynthesize, to me, that would be a little different than if it's a situation where the tree has been dying back uh, from the tips in. Um, then, you know, th there's something definitely going wrong with that tree. So again, uh, some photos, um, maybe submitting a sample if needed to figure out what the problem is so, so you can figure out how to, how to deal with that. Yeah. yeah. Martha I, also that, said yeah. that she, uh, her husband ignored her advice to not eat it and uh, tasted one firm one from the tree. So you're not alone, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. a firm persimmon. Oh dear. Now that is yeah. liquid. I, my apologies. Everyone has to learn <laughs> that at some point. <laughs> yeah. I learned my lesson. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, Ellen, real quick on the um, plant diagnostic lab. I know we've had some changes to how that operates a little bit. So the process for submitting samples for identity identification of issues or diseases. Could you kind of um, brief us on what's going on with that right now? Sure. Uh, and, and if anybody else, I know that these things are fluid and it's been changing a little bit. So if I'm getting this wrong, just let me know. Um, but it's my understanding that right now all sam samples do need to go through the extension office. So they've got to go through the county office um, and that's the best way to do it anyways. Um, uh, so submitted to the county office, then from there submitted to one of our two state diagnostics lab. They are uh, taking all sorts of samples right now, so not just commercial. Um, for a little while it was just those commercial samples. Um, but uh, if you've got a question, um, if you have uh, you know some, some weird looking issues on your trees, the best starting place is taking uh, a sample, maybe sending some photos as well to your county extension agent, um, either uh, Agriculture and Natural Resources, ANR, or Hort, Horticulture, um, depending on the nature of the sample and, and who you have available in your office. They're mm -hmm. a great starting place because, um, you know, they might have seen this issue a lot of times with other people in your county. Um, and if so, you know, that's a, that stops the question right there and you can get right, right. to it. And if they haven't, then they'll be able to send samples to the state diagnostics lab. Now there's no charge for that. Um, it's free of cost, um, but it's done through those county offices.
Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen. That was kind of my understanding, but I just want to make sure I know you're very um, um, con conversant in what's going on with that. And, and no, so thank you. It's a fantastic much. resource. And a lot of states, they do require a fee to, to do that um, because, you know, what happens behind the scenes when you do submit a sample to that diagnostic lab mm -hmm. is really technical and they get exactly, you know, figure out what's wrong with that. Um, so it's a fantastic resource, but a lot of times it might not be necessary if your county agent have, has already seen that kind of thing. Maybe, right. you know, you've had five neighbors who submitted the same kind of questions. Um, right. And so they can really help you along. Yeah, yeah. good points. Good well, thank you, Ellen. We greatly appreciate you uh, adding yeah. to that with <laughs> information. Yeah. Um, also, Ruth Ann said that uh, she can't wait to your deer season to make venison chili. So Martha, <laughs> you've got a fan there. So. Good job, Martha. It's like we're done for today. Yeah. Um, we want to make sure everybody joins us each week um, mm -hmm. and uh, coming up at 11 o'clock every Wednesday. And so uh, don't make don't forget us and uh, we will try our best to make sure everything gets out the way you would want it to. Uh, we work. Mm -hmm. We try our best to uh, give you different topics. If again, if you have an idea for a show idea, um, you can go to fromthewoodstoday.com and um, submit a little survey button that we have there. You can upload pictures. You can give us feedback. You can do anything uh, pretty much on that survey that you would want to do um, and including give us show ideas, which we greatly would appreciate because we always are interested in what you want to know about. Yeah, no doubt, Renee. Um, we want this to be a benefit to everyone here. Um, so please, you know, let us know how we can serve you all better with this show. Um, we certainly want to. And Renee, before we close, real quick, I was wanting to share something with the, the, the group out there, our viewers, sure. and let them know that we now have the Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course information and registration stuff available. And um, we'll go ahead and pop that link into the um, web or into the chat pod. But uh, real quick, I'm going to pull up the um, screen so you all can see um, what our registration looks like there. This is um, off of our website and we've partnered with a number of the organizations here in the state of Kentucky that serve woodland owners and you're going to be able to hear from them. Um, and we're going to also have some state um, forest tours of management practices that if we're able to kind of meet in person, we will have those um, available for you. So it starts off on August 18th with a tree identification in our green track and we'll kind of keep rolling. We do have two tracks available for folks, a gold track. And the ideal here is that these may be landowners that have already kind of got a management plan and are really trying to look to increase their um, activity on their property with the green track being for people maybe just getting started. But but really all of this information would be of interest probably to people that are interested in woodlands and wildlife here in Kentucky. And then on the 17th of September, I want to let you know about a Woodland Owners Partner webinar. And this is a chance to hear from many of these organizations um, that serve woodland owners here in Kentucky. And then the dates we have set aside for the state forest tours, and you can see those locations there, are going to be on September 19th and 26th. Those are going to take place in the morning. And once you register, for the Wilden Owner Short Course, we'll be passing along additional information about that because we're going to have to have a sign up for that as well. So I would encourage everybody, if you're interested in learning more about Kentucky's woodlands and wildlife, and you want to kind of interact and learn about all these groups that can help woodland owners and others in the state, um, please make sure that you sign up and register for the Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course. There is no charge for the short course, but registration is required. So um, I'll encourage everybody to go register as soon as we get done with this, um, and, and we'll be um, up sending you updates on that. So please um, sign up and register for that, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you in that program as well. Right. Um, again, uh, next week we have our Forestry 101 series. It's the part three of our series. Um, we're going to have a snake ID and then our ever famous and growing more famous tree of the week. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll let you know what that tree is next week. You'll have to yeah. watch to find out. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. All right, Renee, we did it again. Another great show. Big thanks to all of our um, presenters here today. And um, a big thanks to all of our viewers. We're really doing this for you and to try to be supportive of you. So thank you all so much. Definitely. Until then, until next week at 11 o'clock, we will see you soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.